could carry that kind of weight He will make you Till I make you I would breathe anything but not a life And all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, unto into your glorious day. You called my name. Sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed rescue, my chains were rough, and but you called me a sinner, sinner, man. When I was broken, you were my healing. And now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name.
Khalil, some of our dancers. God delivered Dom from alcoholism, drug dealing, drug using. He's a suicide survivor. God delivered him from suicide, from alcohol, from drugs. So that's why we praise like we praise. Come on. We worship like we worship. Because hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. <laughs> I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am. Now hold on. So these last couple of weeks when we do this song, we, we've been just so in the glory. And there's this freedom dance that we started doing. So I'm, and I'm, you know, I ain't got that kind of swag and rhythm. If, you know, I grew up where if the Holy Ghost hits you, you don't dance, that you get the Holy Ghost, you know. So I need the Holy Ghost to help me with this. But we're gonna try this, you got, you ready? I want y'all, if you can do it, let's do the freedom dance together, okay? One, two, one, two, ready, and. Am I doing it? Here we go. Come on, let's declare it. Come on. Hell lost another one. I am free. <laughs> I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hey, hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. Say 
somebody lift up a shout right here. Come on, right here. Woo! Now, there might be some people in this room. You still find yourself in a dead place. Maybe your emotions are dead. Maybe you feel like your purpose is dead. Maybe you feel like the things that God has called you to do, it's not going to happen. The devil has caused you to believe that it's over. We're going, to detail, we're going to declare this and prophesy this over you. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Come on. Get up, get up, get up. Get up. Come on, everybody help me say get up. Get up, get up, get up out of that. Get up out of that grave. This is not just a dance, this is a prophetic declaration. I need about five or 10 more of y'all to get in a place where you can begin to tell somebody's got a son that needs to get up. Somebody's got a daughter that needs to get up. Somebody's emotions need to get up. Somebody, it's time for you to get up in your prayer life. Get up in your worship. Come on, get up in your giving. Tell the devil, I'm not staying in a dead place. I'm not staying in a dry place. So I need about five or ten more of y'all to help us declare this, this prophetic movement. Oh, I love prophetic movement. Let's do this one more time. Are you ready? One, two, ready, set. Come on, say, get up, get up, get up. Come on, get up out of that grave. Say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, 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 get
of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from always my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life always my song Cause you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good.
You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. For you are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh, oh, you are good, you are good. Oh, somebody praise a good God in the room. Somebody worship a good God in this place tonight. Oh, we praise the name of Jesus. You are mighty God. Hallelujah. Come on, high five somebody. If you know the only reason that they, they, they are your brother and sister from another is because of the blood. Just walk, slap somebody and tell them, thank God for the blood that has put us together. It's the blood that can put Africans, Asians, Filipinos, whites, blood out together and make us one family. The devil is a liar. Blood is thicker than water, brother. Come on, somebody. Amen. It's all because of the blood of Jesus. Woo. Hallelujah. Woo. Wow. Amen. Listen, if we don't stop 80 gems tonight, we, there won't be nothing. I mean, we, we need to get to some things. My God, the blood is my favorite message. I think the American church is weak because of the soil. You know, before there was, let me tell you something. When you cancel the blood, God will allow your, the, your culture to cancel you. That's why you have cancel culture because you first canceled out the blood. Now God is using the word to cancel you. But thank God for the blood. Let me tell you something. In my... Sid Roth called me when I was doing this book, Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven that Destroy Evil Altars. He called me, I was with Apostle Brian Valley and Prophetess Jessica. We were in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Suffering for the Lord. Amen. <laughs> and Sid Roth calls me. And he was so animated. Sid doesn't, when Sid, he was animated. He said, Francis, I'm reading the book on dangerous prayers. He says, I came to the chapter on the seven places where Jesus shed his blood, he says, I lost it. He says, Francis, I realize that's, he said, that's, I've been looking for something to trigger Holy Communion in the body of Christ. Because I think we don't talk about the power of the blood as many times as we need to. And he says, in my old age, as I become older, he says, the more I've taken communion, the stronger I am. And I'm 80 years old and I'm feeling strong. And he says, Francis, I believe it's because I have communion in the morning and at night every day without fail. I fellowship with the blood. So when I hear the songs like what Eddie has done, my God, Eddie, I prophesy that's going to be your best CD ever. I'm telling you. There is a generation hungry for the blood message to be returned. I'm tired of devils and witches living in, this, in the house of the Lord. I mean, there was a time when the old saints, all they had to say was the blood, and every devil would, be, would begin to manifest. My God, thank you. Thank you, Brother Eddie. Amen. Take your seats for a little bit. Amen. One of the most important books I've written in my life is The Order of Melchizedek. I think next to the Bible, it's one of the most important books you could read one of the revelations. It anchors the whole scripture as you understand who Jesus is. And the fact the Bible says as he is in this world, as he is in heaven, so are we on this earth. Or well, the Bible tells me he's a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that's the priesthood that you'll be living in for rest forever and ever. So understand it now so you can cooperate with him now. It's available. A, a sister book to that is Breaking Generational Curses Under the Order of Melchizedek, endorsed by Sid Roth. 
It's a first book that opened up the, its supernatural world. And since then, I've been in the supernatural world of seed growth since then. Amen. Then I wrote the book called Issuing Divine Restraining Orders from the Courts of Heaven. Some of you look like you have got some people you need to restrain. This book might help you. <laughs> uh, you know, when, you, when you're given a, the, the, the apostolic charge by the Lord to anchor the conference called Three Days of Glory, talk to me somebody, amen? I hope some of you are not religious enough to you're being bothered by my cape. I hope you're not being bothered by the fact that I'm wearing a cape. Some of you I know, you know, talk to me somebody. I like him, but why is he wearing that cape? Because I want to. And because he says I walk with Jesus. Amen. It is my free way to evangelize at the airport. Let's sing the blood one more time. And then the next voice you're going to hear is the voice of my friend, Apostle Greg Hood. Thank you, Eddie. One more time the blood. So I'm not going to hear that thing again in my spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Stand up everywhere. That experience, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad tonight. I'm so glad I've been watched in the blood, the blood of the Lamb, so glad I've been washed in the blood, the blood of the Lamb, saved by His power, born again by His Spirit, blood flowed from His feet and hands, now I am a brand new man. The blood that atoned for me was applied to the mercy seat. Jesus, our high priest, used his blood for my liberty. I'm so glad, so glad I've been washed, I've been washed in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. So me the blood protects me the blood redeemed me the blood broke the chains off me the blood destroyed the yoke gives me access to his throne the blood heals every sickness and disease the blood sets the captives free and I I'm so glad so Through his blood I have remission And now I stand forgiven I'm justified, sanctified I once was dead but now I'm alive When he comes I'll see his face Oh, what amazing grace I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb Redeemed by the great I Am Through his blood I have remission and now I stand forgiven, I'm justified, sanctified, I once was dead but now I'm alive, when he comes I'll see his face, oh, I'm washed in the blood, I'm washed in the blood, I'm redeemed by the grace. 
great I am. Redeemed by the great I am. Is what I have with me, friend. I have a Now I stand for now you. Now I stand for giving. I'm justified. Sanctified. Sanctified. I once was dead. I once was but now dead. I'm alive. The blood of the Lamb, so glad. Come on, lift your hands. I have been washed, I have been washed in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying tonight that I'm bringing to you a fresh covering. I'm beginning to pour over you the oil of my joy, says the Lord. For I'm shifting you out of the places to where you have lived and you have said, I've been in the trenches. I've been in the deep places of society and I've wallered in the places of des desperos desperateness. In, and I have set, stepped my place in a place of trouble. But the Lord says tonight unto you, I am moving you out of those desperate places. I am moving you out of the places that you've been wallering in, says the Lord. And I'm bringing you into a place of the fresh oil. I'm beginning to pour out over you. I'm beginning to saturate you in my glory. And you'll begin to see as I see. You will begin to watch as I'm watching, says the Lord. My breath will become your breath. My eyes will become your eyes, says the Lord. And I will begin to move you, not only into this oil, this oil of joy, but I will begin to cause my glory to begin to pour from you, to begin to be that tangible thing that is upon your lips, says the Lord. It will no longer be something that you will speak of that is coming, but it will be that thing that will begin to fall from your lips uh, as the weightiness of my presence to those that you speak to, says the Lord. For I'm moving you out of a season to where you have looked at men and women within the pulpit to bring my glory. And I'm moving you into a new era, says the Lord, to where my body, my bride, my ecclesia will be the ones that carry my glory, says the Lord. For there will be none that will be small. There will be none that will be great, says the Lord, in this new era that I'm shifting you, my ecclesia, into. For you will move, you will move, says the Spirit of the Lord, as one unit in this time that I'm bringing you into. For the things that you will begin to see unfold in this nation, you will say, how will we survive? How will we make it? But my glory will begin to stir within you, says the Spirit of the Lord, and you will begin to see me, my influence and the weight of who I am, begin to move through my church in this hour. You will see the dead raised. You will see the sick healed. You will see entire states begin to shift and be refuges, says the Lord, for those who are looking for me. For I have thrust my sickle into this nation and I am bringing in a great harvest in this time. Do not be moved by what you see or even what you feel, but be moved by my glory, says the Spirit of the Lord. For this is the season of the outpouring of my glory through my ecclesia, says the Lord of hosts. 
Mama Masaya Bebe Bikiti. Come on, just lift your hands for another moment. Father, we, we submit ourselves to you tonight. And Father, we know tonight we don't need to hear from a man. We need to hear from heaven tonight. So Father, speak to us by your spirit in ways that we have not experienced before. For Lord, we know, we know, Father, that we are in a season of transition and transfer. And Lord, we position ourselves to be it and receive it. Angels are moving around this sanctuary tonight. So, Father, we don't only hear the word that you've given us tonight prophetically. We'll not only listen to it and rejoice in it, but tonight we decree it activated in Jesus' name. We decree tonight over this nation and over your ecclesia that there is a pouring out of a new oil over us. We decree tonight that over your ecclesia and over this nation, there is a new flow, a new tap that has been struck into the glory of the throne of heaven. And Father, we decree tonight that this will not be something that will be captured by the hands of men and be prostituted as things in the past have, but this glory will be untouchable by man's hand. We decree tonight that we will steward this glory. We will walk in this glory. We will live in this glory. This glory will become the breath in our lungs and it will become the weightiness of your throne within our hand. We decree tonight that your ecclesia has shifted out of the old and is coming to the new. We decree tonight that the church in America, we are shifting out of religion and we are coming in to the full release of your kingdom in this nation. We decree tonight, Father, that we're trading our old garments, our old titles, our old positions that many have longed for to find fulfillment, and we're stepping into sonship. We're stepping into sonship in your church in America today, and we're seeing America saved. Can somebody give the Lord a hand clap? Something in that word that struck me. You can be seated for just a moment. Stay up here with me, guys, for just a moment if you don't mind. Something that struck me in that word was we're not moving into a new season. We're moving into a new era. New eras have new seasons. But God is shifting us out of this old thing. How many of you are ready for that? Glory. I don't know about you, but I hate religion. I hate it. It's the biggest adversary to the moving of God in the earth today. And God is giving us his kingdom in a greater way. Amen. I feel tonight, I was asked to do this at the end of the service. But I feel led to do it right now. Can I just do what I feel like I need to do? Is that all right? When, some, when, when, when the soil is ready to receive the seed, you got to put the seed in the ground. This atmosphere is pregnant for harvest. Do you feel that? This is not your grandmama's Sunday morning service. I want us to get ready to give. We, th th this is the moment. This is the, the Kairos time to sow. And I want you to get ready to give. We're sowing into glory. We should expect to receive glory. Now, I want you to hear the word of the Lord over this offering tonight. You're not giving in this offering to meet the needs of a conference. 
You are giving and sowing in the glory. The manifest presence of the Lord in this place. And I believe as you sow in the glory, you're going to reap glory. I'm not going to take a long time to, to talk about this tonight. You know, you've been in, you've been in the, 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 the kingdom for a long time. You know what it means to sow a seed and where to sow and how to sow. And you know that you can name your seed. You need to call your seed what it is. And this offering is a glory seed. Because many of you in this room right now, you've been asking God, use me. Testing one, two. Right? You've been asking God, I need an invasion of you in my house, in my marriage, in my children, in my ministry. I need you to invade with your glory, Lord, my life, my community. I'm telling you tonight by the Spirit of the Lord that as we begin to sow into this glory offering tonight, you're going to begin to see movement. Some of you are going to see movement before you get out of the room tonight. Four of you agree with me. Why does it always have to be this way? Some of you, been, you came tonight looking for a prophetic word. Here's your word. How you sow is how you're going to reap. Some of you need big miracles. Now, you don't ever buy anything from God, but you do sow to get a harvest. Amen? I want to take a minute, and I want to just make a declaration over your seeds. You say, Greg, why are you pausing? Because Holy Spirit's speaking to some folks tonight. So I want to give you just a second to listen to him and not me. Is that all right? God's going to stir some of you to give like you've never given before. I hear the Lord saying tonight that someone in here is saying, God, I need a jump start. The battery's been dead. I need to be jump started. Hear the word of the Lord. Your jump start is here tonight. <clears throat> Father, this is going to be a memorial for many of these in here tonight. And it's going to speak loudly, not only into heaven, but from heaven. And Father, I thank you right now that as we are giving into this offering, as we're sowing into three days of glory, into Francis Miles' ministry, that this is good ground that is ready to receive and to give. For Lord, I believe we're in a moment right here where reaping is going to begin to overtake sowing. So Father, tonight as we hear you, we listen to you about what seed we are to put into this glory ground tonight. Harvest is sure. So, Father, tonight we call our seed the glory seed that goes into the glory soil that's going to bring your glory into our lives and our purpose into our assignments that you've given us. For, Lord, we know that your kingdom has come and your will is being done, but there is a greater expansion than we've ever seen before. We sow into that night, Father. There's a couple of things that I want to just say to you before you get your offering totally ready. How many like these beautiful paintings, pictures, this art? Three of you do. I don't think you heard me. Y'all give Carmela a hand. Isn't she an incredible expression of the kingdom of God? The ministry has informed me that if you are if you sow tonight a thousand dollars they want to they want to sow back into you they want to give back into you a token of their appreciation and you see these paintings are numbered up here if you give a thousand dollars or more put a number of a painting on your offering that you like and they're going to send you one they said also that if you give five hundred dollars 
or more, you can put the number of one of the medium-sized paintings on your offering, and the ministry wants to send you that also as a token of your appreciation. Uh, I want to, man, I'm usually not bent this way. But I'm hearing the Lord saying that there are four people in here tonight that God's speaking to you about a $10,000 seed. And you were really struggling about it. You were saying, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. For one of you, it's going to be very easy. For the other three, it's going to be very challenging. But God says if you'll do that, the harvest is coming quickly. So you need to get ready. Somebody needs to tear a check up, put it back in your pocket, and write the other one. Because God is speaking to you tonight about that thing to give. I don't like doing numbers. I hate doing offerings. I'd rather just teach. But the Spirit of the Lord is on this tonight. And I have a responsibility to tell you what he's saying. Is that all right? So when you get your gift ready, I think all the pertinent information is up on the screen there that you need to give. If you want to give electronically, do that. If you want to give a check, make it out to... Francis Miles Ministry, is that correct? Francis Miles International. And you know what? If you're giving online, if you're giving electronic, electronically, cover the fees. Is that all right? Because they get charged a whole bunch when you give out of convenience. So just cover the fees and let them have everything that God said for you to give tonight. Is that good? So stand up. I'm going to make a declaration over you tonight as you're getting ready to give. Father, I decree tonight this is a glory offering and that your glory, your glory soil is receiving this glory seed and that, Father, as we are obedient to give into this glory offering, the weight of who you are is going home with us tonight and we're going to begin to see the influence of the King and his kingdom in ways in our life like never before. I decree over you tonight that laborers are coming into your life to help you with your assignment. I decree tonight that supernatural resources are being released to you. I decree tonight over you there are open doors and there is favor that God is bringing into your life in this glory offering. And I decree over you lastly tonight that the fruit that comes from your life, your assignment, your purpose will remain in the earth until the coming of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now let's bring this offering to the Lord joyfully tonight. Come on. Healing in your glory. Healing in your glory. Yeah. Healing in your glory. Oh, Lord, send your glory. Come on, let's worship him as we get.
tonight. Give him a big shout. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. While you're seated, give the Lord a big praise. Hallelujah. Has worship been awesome tonight? Glory. Thank you, guys. Y'all are awesome. Man, this is, if you can't preach in here, you ain't got no business being in the ministry. I want to tell you real quick, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, you know, Francis said that uh, he and I both are married to Filipinos. And that's a mouthful in itself. I don't have the time to explain the depth of that. But the neck has told the head he has an assignment. And I'm going to go ahead and do it. We've got a couple of books out there that I would like to tell you about. One is... Rebuilding the Broken Altar, Awakening Out of Chaos. Dutch Sheets wrote the forward to this one. I've been told by several people there were, in, in 2021, there were three important books that had been released in our nation or that were, that were printed and ready for, for the nation, very important. And they all three were on altars. Uh, Dr. Miles had written one of those books. His book was called by name. Dr. Chuck Pierce and Alamu Beef Two had written another book on rekindling the fire on the altar. And they said this was the third one, the last one actually that was released, Rebuilding the Broken Altar, Awakening Out of Chaos. In this book, I begin to I talk about how I believe God's going to bring America back to her prophetic destiny by us rebuilding the altar of the Lord in this nation. God's not done with America. I don't care what the idiot, I mean, the, uh, the people that don't know God say. God ain't done with America. In spite of where we have been at times, God is still going to use this nation. And you say, what about our bad history? Yeah, if God could work with Israel, he can work with America. Amen. So this book is back there. I have a brand new book that came out July 2. Dr. Miles wrote uh, an endorsement in this book. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets both wrote forwards in it, and it's called The Gospel of the Kingdom. And uh, this book is back there as well. I'm excited about this book. I've had prophetic words about this book. I actually had to stop writing this book to write this book. And uh, the Lord put this mandate on us, and then he allowed me to get this. This, this is, I wanted to put a subtitle on it, but uh, uh, Dutch and a couple other guys said, Greg, don't put that on there. People won't buy it. I said, but I like it. And uh, being the submissive guy I am, I didn't put it on there, but my subtitle was, I can say it in here, I feel like with family, was Debunking Religion. And uh, this book debunks religion. And I believe it's going to be a great blessing to the body of Christ. If you, we got a lot of other books that we use in Kingdom University back there on our table as well. And if you buy these two books, uh, we'll, I'll give you 10% off. And 10% off anything else you buy on the table if you buy these two books. My folks back there are probably going to shoot me. I do things without permission sometimes. Um, but if you buy these two books, you'll get 10% and everything else on the table will be 10% as well. I want to give these to the apostle of the house. I want to sow them into you, my friend. Bless you, buddy. Thank you, my friend. Yes, sir. Amen. If you don't like them, they're heavy enough to use as a doorstop. Ah, glory. I do feel like God's got a word for this house, for this conference tonight. And I don't know whether you realize it or not, and I, I haven't been hearing, I haven't been able to watch anything going out, but this conference, Francis, is for the nation. And this conference is setting into the atmosphere words that are needed to give God permission to bring the shift 
that is needed in America. You're going to begin to see in this nation over the next several months, everybody say summer months. How many of you ever been on a roller coaster? How many of you enjoyed it? You're a different kind of people. How many of you wanted to throw up? Yeah. How many of you did throw up? Yeah. That's the summer of 2022. It's going to feel thrilling, but you're going to feel like you want to throw up at what we're getting ready to see released out of our nation. There are those that say, Greg, why, why would you talk about that? I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I'm not a doomsday prophet. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I believe in the advancement of the kingdom, and I believe that when kingdoms begin to advance, kingdoms begin to clash. And when kingdoms begin to clash, there's going to be a little bit of upheaval and topsy-turviness in our nation. And there are going to be those that always do what they do. They're going to scream, ah, it's the end times. Jesus is coming. And, you know, these are the signs of the times. I want to encourage you up front. Do not listen to them. This is not the end of days. This is the redemption of the nation. Greg, you don't want Jesus to come back? Not today. Nor tomorrow. I don't want him to come back this year. Well, aren't we, don't we need to get out of this hell hole? No, we need to change this hell hole. You say, Greg, why don't you want Jesus to come back? Because I got family and friends that ain't saved yet. And some of them are so hard-headed, it may not happen before the end of the year. So I'm asking him to hold the reins tight on the horse so my family and friends can get in the kingdom. I even got some enemies I wouldn't mind seeing say. It may take them a little bit longer. I ain't... I, 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 mm. Apostle Jeremiah straightened all this out if y'all need him to in Sunday morning. But there is an occupying before there's going to be a catching away. Are you with me? Now, I feel a prophetic flow on me right now, so I may not even get to my notes. But I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying tonight that there is a shift from a slave mentality within the ecclesia to a royal mentality within the ecclesia. Escapism is falling by the wayside and scepters are catching the hands of kings. And we are stepping into places of rulership Instead of hiding behind rocks and saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, there is a fresh outpouring of boldness that is coming on the church. The weak need, rubber backboned, knee knocking, ministry is over. God is raising up in this nation some ministers that are not afraid to get in the eye of principalities, that are not afraid to get nose to nose and toe to toe with rulers that are in high places. God is going to begin to send some of you to your governors, to your senators, to your representatives, to your mayors, to your school board members, and you're going to say, thus saith the Lord God, you are vacating his seat, for you have corrupted it, you have perverted it, and you have prostituted it. Now the righteous are going to begin to rule and release a joy across this nation that we have not seen since her birth. Entertainment is leaving the ecclesia. One of our problems is that we have needed to be entertained. We've needed to be encouraged. We've needed to be have a cheerleader or a pep rally on Sunday morning. God said to hell with that stuff. 
because it has no kingdom power within it. It's religion. If you let me back, I'll come back, sit on the front row with you, Francis. You may not want me back no more. Let me tell you what's getting ready to happen in the church. The church in America, God is getting ready to release a judgment upon her. And you say, oh my God, judgment, God, please, no judgment. No, 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 no. Judgment is good if it's in your favor. He's pulling out the corruption. He's getting rid of those things that have used his name for their own advantage. He's bringing back signs and wonders and miracles. You know why we haven't had signs and wonders and miracles in the house of God? It's because God is not obligated to bless anybody's agenda but his own. And there have been those that have been prostituting his name. And they have hijacked his gospel. And they have baptized it with religion. And they have said, this is what God came to bring you. And God said, I'm pulling back my hand. I'm stepping back from what you're doing. But there's a remnant that is risen in the nation. There is a remnant that has come forth. And we have said we no longer want any part of religion. We are no longer want any part of the prostituting of the name of our king. We repent of being involved in that. Now, Father, baptize us afresh in your kingdom power and release this generation into the miraculous that you designed us to be. Does this make sense to anybody tonight? Church is over. Religion is done. You're going to stop going to church and you're going to start being the church. Religion's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. Kind of like grandmama's spinach on Sunday afternoon dinner. Don't make, I want ice cream, I don't want that. But the spinach makes you stronger. Anybody remember Popeye? God's shifting us, family. You better hear the word of the Lord. God is shifting us. And there are going to be those, let me tell you, there are more that are hungry for God than there are not hungry for God. But we have, we have, we have led our churches but can our budget be met? How many butts can I get in my seats? And what do I need to do to keep those butts in those seats? And we brought in smoke machines and we brought in lighting and we put a carnival out in the parking lot and we have a form of godliness in the building, but there ain't no power to do anything. And we've said to ourselves, ha! Don't we know how to do church? And God says, I am not in it. I've not been involved in it. You've been like the Pharisees of old. Uh, you'll travel the world over to make one disciple, but when you're done with him, he's twice the hellion you are. Come on. Religion will not be able to survive under this fresh mantle of the kingdom that is being poured out in this nation. Those of you that are called to ministry and you've been looking at the present models that are in the nation today, you just need to go ahead and wipe the slate clean because God's got a fresh model burning in you. There is an awakening. The trembling has started. The shaking has started. And the Lord's word of God says that he starts in his own house. So why are we asking him to shake the White House before we've asked him to shake this house? Is this making sense to anybody tonight? We're on the threshold of the greatest outpouring of revival that the world has ever seen. Matter of fact, we got one leg in the air and we're ready to step over into it. 
But as I was praying this the, yesterday in front of the White House, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, stop making revival the end goal. Revival is not our end goal. Awakening and transformation, reformation is our end goal. We don't want a move of God just in the house of God that makes us feel good about ourselves. We don't want our buildings just to fill up. We want revival and awakening on aisle nine at Walmart. We want it on the job site. We want it at the red light. We want it in the bar. We want it in the strip club. We want the Spirit of God to begin to stir. Let's, ah, Eddie James. The Spirit of the Lord says over you, there is an influx of preacher's kids that are getting ready to come to you from the music industry, from the strip clubs and the nightclubs. They've been filled with religion and they've run away from it. But the Lord said now is the season that the sons of the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and the pastors and the evangelists are going to begin to come to you. He spoke to you some years ago that God was going to use you with the children of the ministry. But the children of the ministry, I hear the Lord saying, have been living as the children of the corn. But God said, I'm sending a pestilence to eat the field. And I'm beginning to bring to them what they've been craving for. It is my kingdom and not a religion. It is my kingdom and not a denomination. It is my kingdom and not a steeple or a stained glass windowed building. They've been looking for the king. And the Lord says, you are weeks, months away to seeing a trickle. But then God said, by the end of the year, I'm going to begin to open a double door. And that double door is going to begin to allow the sons and the daughters of the fivefold ministry to begin to come into who he has given you. You've been saying, God, I know I'm more than what I'm doing now. And you've been agitated and irritated because there's been a missing piece. There's been a switch that's not been flipped. There's been a door that's not been open, and you said, Lord, I'll stay right here. I'll keep doing this whole thing that I'm doing now, but I know there's something more. And the Lord says, son, because you have brought this subject up to me, I am obligated to flip the switch. So I decree today the sons and the daughters of the fivefold are coming into Eddie's life. I decree they're coming out of the strip clubs. They're coming out of the bars, the nightclubs. They're coming out of the places of perversion where the enemy is held captive, their gifts and their callings and their inheritances. I decree that they're coming out. Even some are going to leave politics that have been involved, been involved in politics. Eddie, there's some that are coming to you that are not going to be in their young 20s. They're going to be in their 30s. God says, I'm opening this door for you because now is that time that I'm bringing my sons and my daughters back. You have cried out for the prodigal, and the Lord said, I'm bringing them to you. There's a piece of property that you're going to need, and the Lord says, I'm going to give you this property. It's in another state, and the Lord says, I'm going to open the door for this property to come into your hand. It will look like you'll have to rent it at first, but I'll pay it off very quick, says the Lord, and you'll own it. Mm. I see seven buses. Several of those buses are only filled with bunk beds. Two of the buses are filled with seats. And they all got your logo on it. And the Lord says, I'm going to begin to bring these to you one by one because you will need it as you are taking these around the nation to be flint for the fires of revival to spark from.
You'll find yourself gathering in a park. You'll find at times under a tent. You'll find at times that you will be on a lake in a pavilion. But the Lord says, I'm going to direct you by my spirit. There'll even be those that'll talk about you in the church, but they're in the wrong church. They're in the religious system. And the Lord says, don't let that move you. The kingdom message is going to begin to swell up in you like never before. Hear the word of the Lord, Eddie. Those that are trying to get out of here, major ministers that are trying to get out of the earth are going to begin to contradict you. But the Lord says, do not fret. They do not control the thermostat of your destiny. There's some that are supporting you big. They're going to drop off. I see two major ones dropping off, but the Lord says, son, you know if I could bring them, I can bring more. And he will. You will never be without. So, Lord, I decree over Eddie today, the finances are there. These tools of ministry that you called buses are there. This tool of ministry that you called a property, I saw it literally as a campus, Lord God, is, is there. And I call it into his assignment. I call it into his purpose. And I decree today, Father, it will not tarry. It will not tarry. It will not tarry. It is rushing to him in Jesus' name. And there's a healing that God's doing in your body. It's in the upper side part of your chest. God's healing you right now. And I just release that total complete healing in you right now, sir. You need to ready your heart because there's going to be such a shift and a change in what you have known as church in this nation. And the biggest adversary of the church, the real church, the ecclesia, the legislative arm of heaven is going to be organized religion. Some of you in here, I don't know any of you. I've only met a couple of you. But there may be even some that are watching tonight that you are neck deep in denomination. And you're going to begin to see yourself leaving those denominations. Well, Greg, can, I, can, they, can they be redeemed? Can, can, can they be used by God? Now, let me make a strong statement. And I'm not coming against people. I'm coming against structure. God is not obligated to put his blessing and his approval on anything that is outside the bounds of his word. And I'm not just talking about doctrine. I'm talking about structure. Does that make sense? In every kingdom, there is a structure. I was praying the other day, and I do pray from time to time. And I heard this statement, Doc. Yeah, I'm going to say it. The Spirit of the Lord said to me that religion and denominationalism, not people, the, the structure, denominationalism is the deep state to the kingdom of God. It's seeking to undermine and to manipulate the strength, the influence, and the control of the kingdom. Now, if you're part of a denomination, I'm not telling you to exit now. I'm just telling you to be led by the Spirit of the Lord. There has to be a coming to terms with the structure that we've been operating under. This word that we've been talking about, glory, everybody say glory. Glory. It's, it's, it's very prevalent in the Old Testament. It's very prevalent in the New Testament. 
In the Old Testament, this word glory is the word kabod. Everybody say kabod. You now speak Hebrew. Hallelujah. But in, in the biblical context, this word glory, it can only be applied. Now listen to this. In its context, it can only be applied to the movement or the activity of a king or royalty. If you apply it in any other way, it's misapplication. Kabod, can, the glory can only be applied to the movement or the activity of kings or royalty. Look at somebody say, I'm a king. You need to know that tonight. You, here's something very interesting. <clears throat> Kingdoms and governments cannot have members. You cannot be a member of a kingdom. You can only be a member of a nation, I mean of a, of a religion. If you're a member of a kingdom, you're a citizen. Amen? Big difference. We've been trying to make people church members. Look at somebody say, we're going to stop that. We're going to make them kingdom citizens. Religious people, religion, religion, it, it positions you to live by what's called rites, R-I-T-E-S, rites. Ritualistic activity that produces no power. But citizens also live by rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. There are things that are inherent to you that are built into you that are yours sovereignly because you're a citizen. We, religion tries to get you to, to do things, rights to be, get God to be pleased with you. God's already pleased with you. He already loves you. He already accepts you. So what do we do? We're not living in that place that we're trying to get God to notice us. We're living in that place now that we are walking our life out through the right of citizenship, not the rights of religious ordinances. Those two things are going to be very controversial in the coming months and years within this nation. R-I-T-E-S will be the enemy of R-I-G-H-T-S. Does that make sense? This word kabod in the Old Testament, it literally means, the, the definition of it, it means weight or weighty. It means influence or influential. It means honor or honorable. So when we talk about the weight, the kabod, the glory, the weight of God in this Old Testament definition, it cannot be brought outside the bounds of operating through the movement or the activity of royalty or of kings. See, God was a king. He's still a king. Amen? God was not a religious figure. Jesus is not a religious figure. Do you believe that? Jesus is not a religious figure. Jesus is not even a religious man. He never came to bring you a religion. He never promised you a religion. He never said, I'm going to soup up a Jewish religion. I'm going to modify this religion and give it to you. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever promise you a religion. The only thing he promises you is a kingdom. And a kingdom is not a religion. And a kingdom does not have a religion. A kingdom is a country, a nation, a government, a state. So Jesus didn't say, I'm coming to be your religious guru and I'm going to give you ways to worship me that makes me feel good about myself. He didn't do that. He said, I am a king and I am coming to restore a kingdom and it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not a religion. Does that make sense? How many of y'all grew up? Some of y'all gray-headed. Some of y'all no-headed. Hallelujah. How many of y'all grew up watching the little rascals? I ain't talking about the colored, you know, the fancy ones that was in the theater. I'm talking about the black and whites. Y'all remember those? Y'all remember these two young men on there, Stymie and Buckwheat? Y'all remember them? Y'all remember the, the episode where Stymie and Buckwheat are sitting on a wagon and they got a mule tied to the wagon, 
and they got the reins and they hitting the hitting the mule and the mule won't move. He's stubborn. He's just standing there. He will not mew. Buckwheat had this inventive idea, this great idea. And if you're from the South, you know, you'll understand this. He got a cane pole. Y'all know what a cane pole is. You go fishing with a cane pole. And he hung a carrot off of the end of this cane pole and he dropped that carrot right over in front of the lips of that mule. Y'all remember that? And that mule wanted that carrot and he started, his lips started moving. Y'all remember that? And he couldn't, he, he took one step, then another step, then, and before long the mule was moving, but he never got to eat the carrot. That carrot is religion. It'll hang out in front of you, but will never give you the ability to partake of what it promises. Religion is not your friend. Now, I know in the South, we, 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 we've learned how to do church. We can do church with our eyes shut. We can ride the ceiling fans. We can swing from the chandeliers. We can huck a buck. Y'all know what huck a bucking is? Yeah. It ain't pretty, but it feels good. Am I right? We know how to do all that stuff. We know how to have church, but we have not yet been good at being church. I decree over us tonight that we're shifting out of having church and we're moving into being church. Come on. What does it mean? It, when we shift out of having church, we will move out of the experiential aspect of needing an emotional charge into the reality of being the embodiment of the throne of heaven. Now, religion just heard that, and I felt some of the air shuck out of the room. <laughs> Jesus said it would be so. He said, great works have I done, but greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. That was not something to tease you or to get hope up in you and then defer it later. No, 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 no. The Bible says that Jesus was the Godhead bodily. And if he is in me, the hope of, of glory, then the Godhead lives in me. He's not, a, he's not a substitute Holy Spirit. He's not an artificial Holy Spirit. He is the Godhead living in us, taking up residence in the house he originally intended to dwell in from creation. You are the most dangerous thing in the earth. But the enemy wants to convince you you're just a sinner trying to make it to heaven the best way you can. I break that lie off for you tonight. If the enemy can keep you believing that, you will always live like that. But if you can step into being the church and embodying the Godhead and doing greater than what Jesus did, we'll begin to see reformation and transformation like never before. Kabod, weighty, weight of a thing. Now, Eddie is not a small man. You got a lot of glory on you, brother. I ain't either. I ain't a small fella. I'm twice the man my wife married. <laughs> but if you were to take the smallest man in the room and you would set Eddie or me on his shoulders, there would be much glory. You want to demonstrate that? Would you let Eddie get on your shoulders? and run around the room. You want to try? 
Later. Later. What would he be able to say? He would be able to say, the glory of Eddie James is upon me. Why? Because it literally means the weight of. Some of y'all been looking for a leprechaun to sit on y'all. No, 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 no. I want the throne, the weight of God setting on us. That's why some of you, when you're being prayed for, you fall over. You're slain in the spirit because the weight of God that comes upon you, it, 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 it's, in a, it's in a measure that you have not yet learned to walk in. Therefore, it overtakes you and you are slain in the spirit. But there has to come a time, family, that every time you get touched, you don't fall over. Why? Because God moves you from faith to faith and from glory to glory, from understanding to understanding, from weight to weight. And if you keep carrying the glory, you'll be able to carry more glory and more glory and more glory. Why? Because you have moved out of experiential Christianity. The more glory he sets on you, the more you ought to be able to carry. And I felt the glory of the Lord when we pulled on this parking lot today. I felt the weight of God in this place. I feel the weight of God in this place right now. But family, what do we have to do? We've got to learn to carry the glory. Some of you are not seeing the breakthrough in your life that you need is because you're wanting another taste of the same measure of the glory that you experience that help you make it from Sunday night to Wednesday night, from Wednesday night to Sunday morning. But God is saying to you, I'm bringing you into a bodybuilding program to where I'm going to begin to deposit measures of glory upon you that you've never experienced before. But what is it going to do? It's going to begin to build your spirit, man. It's going to begin to build the strength that you are, and you're going to be able to carry more of the kabod of God than you've ever carried before in your life. Why? Because it is the glory that is the answer to the nation. In the New Testament, the word glory is the word in the Greek, it's doxa. And it, it's always good in the New Testament. It's never in a negative sense. It's always in a positive sense. And the word doxa, the word glory, it means majesties or royal acts it means honor and the weight of. Same word in the Old Testament, the weight of, but here it literally means majesties or royal acts. It means honor. Let me tell you something else we're going to have to get used to. We're going to have to get used to the honor of the Lord being upon us. Religion has told us that we are not honorable, that we're just old rotten sinners trying to make it to heaven the best way we can, trying to make it there by the skin of our teeth. Your teeth ain't even got no skin. Unless you got a pork rind hung in it, which ain't a bad thing. <laughs> Chicharron, hallelujah. Religion tells you that if you even think that way, you're being dishonorable. But God shows us throughout the New Testament, especially even in the Psalms, it's very powerful that his glory and his weight will rest upon his people. So God is not saying that you're just not going to also carry my honor, but I am going to bring honor to you. Isn't that amazing? God's going to honor me. Yeah. When you're faithful with little, he calls you to be a master 
over much. Look at that. That whole phrase there is, is, is honor. He's going to release things on you. So, But if we stay in this religious mindset that keeps us addicted to Sunday mornings, religion is addictive. Kingdom is empowering. Do you hear me? Religion is addictive, but kingdom is empowering. Some of you, you, some of you have addictive personalities. And one of the things that you have to be careful of is that you don't bounce from one addiction to another. That you don't replace an old addiction with a new addiction. You can easily take religion and replace drug addiction with religious addiction and never encounter who God created you to be. Does that make sense tonight? So when we're looking at this thing and we're looking at how we've allowed counterfeit affections to be our crutch in our life, religion has become one of those counterfeit affections. It's become a crutch. It's become an addiction in our life. And family, I'm going to make a statement right now. Hold your breath. Buckle your seatbelt because what I'm about to say is true. Christianity in its for, in its in the state that it is in right now is no different than Hinduism, than Islam, than Baha'i, or any other religion in the world. Why? Because it has moved away from kingdom empowerment and it has set itself in the foundation of counterfeit affections. You say, Greg, the church is not like that. Yes, it is. And somebody's got to talk about it. Somebody needs to say something. Now, I know the church in Georgia is not like that, but the other 49 states and territories is eat up with it. You need to allow Holy Spirit to set you in the interrogation room and look across the table and ask you why you did it. Come on, smile at me. Amen. We are in a place of transition and transfer because the glory of God is shifting us out of addiction into empowerment. I want to say one more thing in this next five minutes, and then I'll say something else in the next five. I don't want to make you promises I can't keep. God only shows up where he instructed you to meet him. Can I say that one more time? God only shows up where he's instructed you to meet him. God never told you to meet him in the room of religion. I know it hurts. I know I'm not preaching to you tonight. I'm preaching to people on the online and somebody's going to watch us in 10 years and be blessed. But God is not obligated to show up anywhere he did not tell you to meet him. If you're going in a direction that is contrary to the kingdom, not the religious interpretation of this book, but the kingdom revelation of this book, God may not be there. He most likely will not be there, but we have these experiences that we have created to convince us that he's there. And when we leave the room of religion, we are not changed. Does this make sense? We have had an experience that has been transactional instead of relational. See, religion is transactional. The kingdom is relational. Does that make sense? Religion says, give me this and I'll give you that. Give me this, a little bit more, I'll give you that. Give me, give me this, I'll give you this experience. I'll give you this feeling. 
I'll give you the doodads running up and down your back. Testing one, two. I know it's getting late, but just hang on. I got one shot at you. Whenever you feel like you have to do something to get something, you are living in a transactional relationship. Religion is that. Religion says you must do this to get that. God, you must do this and God will give you that. You must do this, then God will be pleased with you with that and so on and so forth. The list could go on and on. But in the kingdom of God, it is not transactional. It is relational. The relationship has to do with citizenship. Nobody has to convince me I have a right to vote. Because I am an American citizen, I'm supposed to be among a group of people that they are the only ones allowed to vote. Come on, smile at me now. I'm an equal opportunity offender. Religion has married the political spirit in our nation. And they've crawled in bed together and impregnated themselves and they've given birth to a compromised church. That's why people that call themselves Christians can come to church Every Sunday, Wednesday night, Sunday night, revival night, sing on the praise team, give the biggest offerings in the house and still support candidates that want to kill our babies. Francis will fix this tomorrow night. Y'all just bear with me. I got to get this off my chest. That's why somebody could be a member of a church and vote for a candidate in government. <laughs> by what they will put in their pocket. Religion will tell you it's okay. And that you have God's permission. To vote for a political candidate. A governmental leader based solely on the color of their skin. Not their ideology, not their philosophy, not how they view God, but simply because they may be red, yellow, black, or white, or pink, purple, polka dotted, whatever suits your fancy. If you do that, you are living under religion. Religion will make you feel very comfortable about voting for political candidates that will increase your welfare. How much money will they give me? How big is my check going to get? How many more babies do I have to have so I can get more money? Come on, y'all get quiet on me in here. I must be touching a nerve. When your political views contradict to kingdom views, you are living in religion. And religion is dictating how your life and your worldview is unfolding before your very eyes. And you will not have kingdom power. You will have religious experience that will enable you to feel good about what you're doing. Religion will allow you to vote for a political candidate that only wears a crown and not a robe. See, we look at our politics and we separate it from our walk with God and that was never the intentions of the founding fathers. I'm a history teacher. I know some of you think, I wouldn't want him teaching my children history. I did, I used to teach history. I'm a direct descendant of John Adams and John Quincy Adams. They're my granddaddies and a long line of folks. 
I studied our constitution, the birthing of this nation, and I agree with you. Our nation has a lot of skeletons in our closet, and it's time to fling the door open and deal with them. And when we deal with them, it will not be about critical race theory. It will not be about Irish slavery, which my family came from Irish slaves. Come on, look at me tonight. Smile at me for just a minute. It will not be about the the slave trade from Africa. It will be how we married the political and religious spirit that took the prophetic destiny of a nation and hid it somewhere on a shelf to where we could not be who God created us to be. God said that America in 1607, a man named Robert Hunt landed on the shores of Virginia. It wasn't even Virginia yet. It was called Cape Henry. And he took a mast off of a ship and he made a cross and he planted it in the sand and he prophesied the gospel of the kingdom of God will go into this new world and from its shores it will go into every nation of the world. That's God's plan for America. So it's no coincidence that God brought the nations to America so that he could send the gospel of the kingdom to the nations. So we were designed to be a nation of many different ethnic groups. Are you with me? Are you okay? Anybody need a defibrillator? I know this is a little bit different, but if we're going to shift, if we're going to really make the change, our politics has to shift. See, it ain't about the elephant or the ass. It's about the lion. You shouldn't be so tied to the, to the corrupt Republicans and the corrupt Democrats that you cut your ties with the lion. My granddaddy, he was a good man. He was ignorant in some ways. Ignorance is not a bad thing. Ignorance can be changed. Stupid can't be changed, but ignorance can be changed. Y'all remember the great philosopher Forrest Gump? He said, stupid is as stupid does, right? My grandfather said some stupid stuff. One of those things was he was so ingrained in the Democrat Party. He said if Satan was running as a Democrat and Jesus as a Republican, I'd have to vote for Satan. I said, Granddaddy, you stupid. And the next thing I remember, I was waking up (laughs) off the floor because he done cold cocked me for calling him that. But I was young enough to know better. When your politics, dictates to you how you are viewing the world and you're allowing the elephant or the ass to do that, you are religious. You might be a Pharisee. You, and I've had people tell me, they've said, Greg, I vote the man. No, you don't. I vote the person. No, you don't. Why? I, I've been around this stuff a long time. Joanne, my wife, ran for the state house in Hawaii twice. I've been around both parties. I know how they work. Any candidate that does not conform to the party platform will have one term. It doesn't matter how good of a Christian that they think they are. It doesn't matter how many times they go to church. It doesn't matter if they take communion every week. It doesn't matter how much money they give. They will conform to the party platform. So my encouragement to you tonight is read the party platforms. Here's our platform. This one right here is our platform.
And the book, book of Deuteronomy tells us that when we're, when we're selecting people to serve on a national level, we need to select people that are honest. That knocks out 90% of Washington, D.C. We are to select people that, that fear God. There's the other 10%. We are to select people that are capable. That gets most all of them. We're in the three branches now. We're losing our nation. Then he says to select people that hate bribes. How do you go in to politics in D.C. or Georgia or wherever you may live and you go in barely making it financially and come out a millionaire. Just food for thought. Does that make sense? If we're going to shift and if we're going to see revival and awakening, we must shift our politics. We must shift the way we perceive and inter interact or engage with government. Some of you have got to get off of your couch and you've got to go pull your papers and run for office. Some of you need to get on your school board. Some of you need to run for state house, state senate. Some of you need to run for governor. Some of you need to run for a federal office. Some of you need to run for whatever it is that's causing your community problems and get in there and change it. And you may say, Greg, I don't want to do that. Do it for one term and raise somebody up to take your place. Does that make sense? Those that governed our nation in the early parts of this country, many of them were ministers, preachers. We've had several presidents that were preachers, ministers in the second great awakening. They helped ignite that thing. There was a group of men back in the 1700s that ignited, that fuel, that festered the Revolutionary War, and they were called the Black Robe Regiment. Who were they? Preachers. Men who stood in pulpits. And when they would stand in their pulpit, they would wear their long black robe, and they would preach. And when they would finish their sermon, they would take their robe off, lay it across the pulpit, put on a continental uniform, put their pistols in their holsters, and lead the men of their congregation out to fight the British. We need some preachers like that. We do it. We need to get some of these rubber backbone preachers in their skinny jeans and Y'all bear with me. I'm feeling ornery. <laughs> Let me just give you some revelation. Can I give you some revelation? Skinny jeans were not made to make you look skinny. They were made for skinny people. And if you wear them and you are not one of those, you become a muffin top. I'm just saying. I got to wear baggy jeans. I can't wear skinny jeans. I need a belt and suspenders sometime. <sighs> we try to conform to everything that we can to get people in the building. And we've elected men that wear crowns only. We've sent people into government offices who only wear crowns. They wear the king anointing. They're able to govern. But the scripture shows us that under this new priesthood that Jesus came in, this Melchizedek priesthood, that we're not just kings and we're not just priests, but we are a royal priesthood. Every politician needs to wear a robe with his crown. He needs to have a priestly anointing and a kingly anointing. Just like preachers, they need more than a robe. They need a crown. 
We need to begin to walk in this Melchizedek order, this priesthood order that operates from a place of an endless life that carries the power of heaven with it. Not this Levitical thing that we've been trying to fit ourselves into, but we need to step into the order of Melchizedek, the order of Jesus, and when we do, reformation cannot help but manifest. Man, I didn't even get to use my notes. And I worked hard on them. And they were good. What is God saying to us here tonight in this glory conference? If you want my glory, shift. I'll say one more thing. And then maybe something else. He said I had two hours. Y'all were here late last night, I heard. But here's something else that's so important for you and I as we make this shift is that God's not obligated to answer any prayer that you pray that is outside the bounds of his purpose for your life. Do you hear me? We've got to start praying prayers that have to do with purpose. And if you can discover who God created you to be, then you can begin to pray in the will of God. And Jesus said that when you pray, pray your kingdom come, not a religion come, your kingdom, your government, your nation, your country, that thing come, and your will be done. Where? In earth. Not in not, not 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 let your earth be done in heaven, but let your will and your kingdom that's in heaven be done on earth. Religion flipped it on us. It's we flipping the flip. Hallelujah. There's a shift that is happening right now in the body of Christ in this nation. And we cannot allow ourselves to hang on to any piece of that religious experience that keeps us transactional. We've got to be willing to let it all die, to let it all go away so that this relational sonship, citizenship, kingship, anointing, glory can begin to be activated in your life like never before. Are you with me? Can I, can I borrow one of your keyboard players, Eddie? These summer months are going to be very challenging for us as a nation. The fourth quarter is going to be a time that we're going to begin to be used by God to help bring a realignment in the nation. As you're seeing these things begin to unfold, do not let fear grip you, but understand that you have been equipped and empowered for this change. The reason all of the uglies come into the surface in our nation is the church's fault. Because we've been praying. God, give us revival. God, give us awakening. He said, all right, I got to expose all of this garbage, all of this corruption in the nation. And we say, well, let the government be the government. Let let, let all that just go. That's going to go to hell anyway. It's all going to burn up anyway. God said, no, I'm in redeeming nations. And we've got to get back involved in the earth because your gift is not needed in heaven. Your anointing is not needed in heaven. You're not actually from heaven. You're from earth. You were created out of the earth, out of the dirt. Your destiny is not heaven. You're not going to be a little naked baby floating around on a cloud playing a harp. That'd be an ugly sight for some of us. But that's what religion tries to tell you. My destiny is heaven. No, there's this beautiful thing called the returning of Christ. That every saint that goes before he comes is coming back with him to an earth. Here, ruling and reigning in a new heaven and a new earth. This is where you were designed for. 
This is where God's going to begin to shift us greater, our greater focus to. Mm. Stand with me. Father, I pray tonight that you would empower your ecclesia to make this shift. There's a gear changing. There's momentum that's gathering within the church. There's a hunger that is being released for not just the supernatural, but the king of the supernatural. And Jesus, I pray that you would begin to step right into the middle of religious structures that you were never afraid of and begin to challenge them and change them. Father, there are steepled buildings all over this nation that have conformed to the religious structure. I pray you'd invade those places. Father, I pray that you would use us to do what you did in your day in stepping into religious synagogues and the temple and the, the porch and dealing with those Pharisees and Sadducees and those religious things that held your people in bondage, the Jewish people that are holding our nation in bondage today. Stir a fire within us, Lord, and a boldness within us. Give us a fresh baptism. You want a fresh baptism tonight? Lift up your hands. Give us a fresh baptism of Holy Spirit in our lives tonight. Father, we open ourselves up and we say, Father, fill us. Flush every ounce of religion out of our lives. Flush it out. Somebody shout, flush it out, God. Shout, get religion out of me. Baptize me into your kingdom, O oh Lord. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Hey! Brosora da Bahani Hete Krebi. Bresharara Rabo Renemendere Bekete. Father, I pray that we'll move beyond the need of titles and we'll step into our sonship in a greater depth than we ever had before. Enable us to move past our desires to be noticed, to have our own ministries, to have people gather and run to us. Even though you've designed us to lead people, Father, move the desire to be seen out of our lives. That we may show forth you, King Jesus. Save America. Father, I've heard you say many times through your prophets and to me, Lord, even in times of prayer that you will have America again and you need her. You need this nation for this great awakening that you are bringing to the nations of the world. Father, I know we're not the only one. We would, wouldn't be so arrogant to think so. But we play a part. Save her. Redeem her, Lord God. Bring us out from under the demonic influences of principalities and powers and false thrones and false crowns that have set themselves up in this nation and establish your footstool in America again. We believe it. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. My brother, the Spirit of the Lord says over you that the nations are getting ready to open for you again. But it's going to be a different road that you're going to go down than you've been before. The Lord says the governments of nations are going to open to you. And you're going to begin to find yourselves in the halls of kings and prime ministers and presidents. You're going to find yourself standing before those that make the laws and that govern nations. 
The Lord says he's going to open the states up to you as well. Even those that would be governors in this nation, you're going to find yourself standing in front of them. And the Lord says, bridle not your tongue. For there is a fresh prophetic anointing that is coming upon you for this season that he's bringing you into. And the Lord says that he's going to open Asia and Europe to you. And that as you begin to move throughout Europe and Asia, there will be other nations that will call. But the Lord will say, make sure you stay in your lane. Make sure that you stay on the trajectory that I've shot you out of my bow with. For I will cause you to begin to see a Psalms chapter 2 manifestation in your ministry and in your life. I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and I will give you the nations for your dwelling, says the Lord. For the Lord says, I'm even redeeming your lineage. There's a movement, the breathing of the Spirit of the Lord upon your family and the generations that are behind you. And the Lord says he's even breathing now on the generations ahead of you. And there is a redemption coming in your family, man of God, that you thought, well, these are those family members. Everybody's got them. We love them. We pray for them. But God said there are four people in your family that are so full of mockery that 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 they do not believe in what you do nor do they believe in the God you believe in three of them are men and one is a woman and God said I'm getting ready to radically jerk the slack out of the chain that they're tied to and bring them in they're older people one of them's a one of them's in their 20s but the rest of them are older the Lord says, as I do this, watch me bring your family into the royal anointing. So, Lord, over this prophetic word, I decree the nations are opening. Asia and Europe are opening for him. I decree the ch- slacks coming out of the chain for his family members. And I decree great favor is coming upon him as he stands before men and women that rule and make rule that they, Father God, they will begin to hear the word of the Lord and the kingdom deposit that this man carries will begin to go deep into the soils of the nations in Jesus' name. And over you, your name is Miles. The Spirit of the Lord says over you that you've been crying out for your generation. And the Lord says, I'm getting ready to break the the stereotype prophet off of you. There are molds that people have tried to put you in, but you haven't wore Saul's armor very well. And the Lord says the stereotype that they've tried to make you, he's breaking off. For you're not a Saul, you're a David. You've been in the backside of the desert already. You've you've slain some lions and you've slain some bears, but you've known that you are not actually walking in what you were designed to do. And the Lord says that that prophetic gift that is on your life is a secondary gift. And he's been maturing that gift within you So that when he brings you into your primary gifting, you will know the voice of the Lord. You will not only be able to hear him and discern him and know him, but you will be able to release the voice of the Lord in a realm and in a sphere that prophets have been banned from. There is an apostolic mantle upon you. But that apostolic mantle is not for the ecclesia. It is for government. And God's going to begin to burn within you a fire for this nation. And you're going to prophesy into America. You're going to prophesy into her destiny. You're going to prophesy into the men and the women that lead this nation. And then the Lord says, one morning you will wake up from a dream that he has brought you into and you will say, my apostolic ministry has been activated and I'm called to this nation. 
and you're going to do something that is unorthodox. You're going to do something that the church and the religious world are going to scorn you for. They're going to say you're stepping backwards. They're going to say that you're walking away from your calling, but you will actually walk out the dream that God gave you. And you will run for political office. You will be, you will run for a house seat and you will win. You will serve there and God will place other apostolic leaders around you to help steward you. Your prophetic voice, your prophetic gift, that secondary gift will never dull. It will increase as the apostolic governmental anointing increases. And then the Lord says he will speak to you to run for a governor of a state. And you will run and you will win. The Lord says as you've stretched your heart towards me, wrap your heart around me. For I have brought you into this earth. You are one who is special to me, says the Lord. And you have said to me, I will do whatever you want me to do. I will forsake all others and all else. And the Lord is saying unto you tonight, he's heard your terms of negotiation with him. And he has accepted them. And you've been loaded into the bow of a master archman. And you're getting ready to be released from his bow. Great favor is coming upon you and your prophetic gift is going to open many doors for you in the future. The Lord says to you as you walk through them, know that I've been there before you got there and only say what I say and only do what I do and I'll bring great favor even more upon you, says the Lord. For you'll not have to prove yourself, you'll just prove me. For I'll walk in with you. And the Lord says that your children, your children, you hear me? Your children will represent one each of the one-fifths of the gift of Christ. There will be five children and they each will stand in one of the fivefold gifts. And the Lord says, I'm establishing your household and your lineage as a priesthood, but I'm releasing a grace and a favor upon you to govern in the realm of government as an apostolic leader. So Father, I decree that activated. I decree it in motion. And I decree today, Father God, that his ear will hear and his eyes will see as they never have before as you create this lineage for him. I got one more word. Is it okay? Apostle, come up here. Francis, come stand with me. Is, your, is, that, is that your wife? Bring her up here. I don't know, I like to assume I get in trouble a lot. Oh, I can tell now you look much better with her you know, I know the feeling. I know the feeling, man. I married way up. The Lord says that you're an agitator and that you're going to begin to agitate more and more. Things will not calm down. They will agi the agitation will increase. Not the agitation into your life, but the agitation from your life. And the Lord has spoken to you that you've got to make some moves, not geographically, but you've got to make some decisions that could be challenging to the present structure. And the Lord says it's no coincidence that you've embraced your apostolic calling in the midst 
of your brothers that believe in Saul's mantle. And the Lord says, more will be saved and redeemed than will be lost. But do not allow your heart to be broken because of those that are lost. It sounds weird. But the Lord says, let your heart rejoice in the numbers that will be saved, restored into the kingdom. For your calling is within the club of the Pharisees. I wouldn't want that calling. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a great favor upon you among people, not in your own group, but other groups that are around that, that, are, that are stuck in such a deep religious structure that is hindering them from seeing the things that they actually preach. And the Lord says you're going to be like that battering ram that's going to begin to break down the gates, the places of authority that will allow freedom to come in and behind the walls that they've been hiding behind. And the Lord says that you're going to see in these next several months a greater desire to take care of sons. Sons are coming. They're going to come out of the woodwork. They're going to come and they're going to be people that are going to be like Nicodemus. They're going to come and want to sit with you in the night and go back to what they did in the day. And the Lord says, do what Jesus did. Say, you can't have what I have and go back to what you had. You've got to be willing to make the shift. And I'm telling you, there's such a favor that God is bringing upon you too in the circles that you run in that they will say, we hate them, but we love them. We can't kick them out because we need them to stay. Because a great upheaval is coming at the top, the very, very top. And they're going to be those that are going to try to divide and fracture what you're a part of right now. But the Lord says, stand in the gap, for the fracture will delay what he wants to do. There will be a time the structure will not be as influential as it is because he's not putting his kingdom in the structure He's breaking the structure so he can insert his kingdom. And so, Father, I decree over this couple today that as they go forth in this assignment, that is not an easy assignment. It can only be an assignment for a general, for those that have come into their generalship. And I see the Lord placing another star on your shoulder tonight for the assignment that lies ahead. And it's not only a star on your shoulder Daughter, it's a star on your shoulder as well. For you walk as one as you have you, you have moved more into the apostolic. The Lord says that it seems the prophetic is, is sometimes if and or. And, but the prophetic in you, daughter, has been growing stronger and stronger and stronger. And the Lord says, I'm going to amaze them. And I'm going to frustrate them. And I'm going to bring great confusion to them because of the prophetic mantle that I am releasing you in. It will not be the gift of prophecy as my spirit can release, says the Lord, but it will be you being established and set in the office of a prophet. For you've entered into the day that who you are is coming forth. You will not be able to be the pastor's wife any longer. You'll be the pastor's prophet. And the apostolic anointing on you and the prophetic anointing on you will begin, will, be, will begin to lay a kingdom foundation in this house. But the Lord says, I'm putting jackhammers in your hand first and you're going to begin to break up the religious things that have been hidden in the old foundation. And the Lord says that you'll not do this in a way that you have a strategy but you'll do it from revelation so Lord I release over this man tonight a new depth of wisdom 
and revelation. As he reads your word, kingdom is going to leap out of the pages. And the Lord says this will not be your only apostolic center. This place here is not a it's not a church. It's an apostolic center. There will be many apostolic centers that will be birthed out of this house in this state and also in South America. The Lord says, I'm going to begin to bring an influx of the Latino community. And the Lord, and the Lord says they will not have their own service. They will be interwoven into the net that he has created this place to be. And the Lord says there will be a great harvest in the Latino field in this region. So Lord, tonight we just activate that, commission them in that tonight. This new star has been put on their shoulders. It means new responsibility, new accountability as they move forth to militarily kingdom take this region one more piece as the Lord says your house is coming into order and they're going to fall into line with what you prophesied over them from the times they were in the womb. God's reactivating that and watch him show out for you. Come on, somebody get, ought to give God a shout. Somebody ought to thank God for the apostle and the prophet. Talk to me, somebody. Hey! I, I feel one thing, Apostle, before you go. I really feel that you need to do the, there's only one group of people I want you to lay hands on. Uh, I mean, you're going to go down there. You don't need the microphone to do that because I'm just, but I just feel you cannot finish. Maybe take up some of that oil. I feel that you, we, any, I feel, my wife began to feel, and I'm feeling a confirmation of that right now, that you need to lay hands on those Outside of Miles Kobe that you have prophesied over, those in, uh, in our here who feel called to political office at yes, any sir. level to come up here because I hear those opening up in the realm of the Spirit. I want to believe that the government of America is changing because God's people are going to rise. I am telling you, God's people are going to rise. We can, we can, we can. We can be appalled by these sexually perverse school boards. But instead of just being appalled, we need to replace them. Yeah. That's right. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? Are you catching what I'm saying? Because who knows? Maybe you have been raised to the kingdom for such a time as this. So if you feel a call to the political office, come here. An apostle will be down here and he's going to pray for you as Eddie sings the blood song. Apostle, go and lay hands on those who are called to political office because I want to see new governors. I want to see senators. I want to see congressmen. I want to see school board leaders, school board chairmen who are filled with the Holy Ghost because we, are, we, are, we can be the generation that lost America. Maybe when we're not on our watch, somebody not on our watch, we can be the generation that lost America. The devil is a liar. Amen. So those who are called to political office stand there and receive the anointing as the man of God sings about the blood. God is the blood that makes everything. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you, Jesus.